Hello, it's great to finally be bringing archives to your town. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also like to let Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know that they're respectfully advised this webinar contains a range of material which may be culturally sensitive, including records of people who have passed away. So, archives on tour. Hello Dubbo, it is fabulous to be with you, at least virtually. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. And a particular welcome to Melissa from Dubbo Library and the people joining us possibly from the library too. This is how we got here. One of New South Wales State Archives strategies is to engage across the state through our regional network and touring exhibitions. Archives on tour is another way we're using to really focus on regional New South Wales. Archives on tour started in 2018-19 when we took parts of the 1828 census on a bit of a tour of some of the areas in the census, partly to celebrate the inscription on the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register. So for 2019-20, we decided to take parts of six of the big series of archives that cover the whole state to six different towns across New South Wales. Well, we all know what happened then. COVID disrupted many plans, including archives in your town, but you know, we're still going. What we felt was that at the heart of every town are people and buildings, and we can have hold archives about people and the buildings of the town all across the state. They cover a huge range of subjects and perspectives as you'll see today. So this is what we're going to do. We're virtually bringing you archives about the people and buildings of Dubbo. We'll talk about the series of archives and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives as well. There'll be time for you to share your memories and knowledge and we really encourage you to do that. Out of the literally, and I mean literally millions of archives we hold, we've picked just a few to show. The great thing is that Archives in Your Town has its own web pages on our website, so you can browse the digital versions of the archives we talk about at your own pace later. Where are we going? Well, we started in Tamworth, but today we're in Dubbo, and then we'll be heading to Broken Hill, Tweedheads, Coma and Wagga. The files that we're going to be looking at include the school files, plans of public buildings, bidders and public halls files, bankruptcy files, deceased estate files and probate packets. We've worked with the staff from Dubbo Library right from the beginning, and I want to thank them for being so willing to be involved. They suggested some of the people and buildings and provided us with background information. So school files. An amazing series, NRS 3829 covers 1876 to 1979. So over a century of fantastic material. They were created by bringing together all of the correspondence about each school from the correspondents. It includes material from teachers, parents, the education department and district officers, other government departments, local members of parliament and the education ministers. The later files from about 1940 onwards don't contain detailed information about teachers and they're also much more official in tone. They show you how the schools worked and how the schools interacted with the community. So Emily's going to take you behind the scenes and give you an idea of what they show. So in this file on Durham Bar School, we start with the application and there's actually an inspector's report talking about the establishment of the school, explaining where Durham Bar is. So it's on the Tweed River, talking about it being a, for, a farming community, good land and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, people listed in the local community who would promote the local school. Uh, we've got a list of how many students might, might be expected to attend. We've got a map of the school district and where the residents who have children might be living. Mm 
a lot of correspondence about teachers. They almost feel a little bit like a personnel file when these things didn't exist. Um, here for this teacher, William Tashihi, we've actually got a list of his previous employment and comments to do with his promotions and things like that from 1896 back to 1889. We've got a list of families, number of children who were supposed to attend the school and why they weren't attending, often due to the weather or being ill or one because they had a sore foot. Here from 1897, we have um, William Sheehy resigning this time due to his charge of obscene language in the local billiard room and the inquiry that ensued. Correspondence to do with the school site. So talking in 1901 about dedicating two acres as a site for the public school. There's a copy of the portion plan, the crown plan and there's the two acres that they're going to dedicate for this school. So the files are listed in our online schools and related records index. They're just called administrative files and they cover those years 1876 to 1939, 1940 to 1979. You can also pick them up through the catalogue so you can pre-order them for the reading room. Because of their varying size, we don't offer them through the copy order service, but it is something you need to come into the reading room to have a look at. And because there's so much material about teachers and other, other aspects of the school, they work really nicely in hand with the teachers' career cards and the teachers' roles. They work nicely with the school photographs and they also work together with our admission registers, punishment books, and the other resources that we've got from some public schools in New South Wales. So only public schools, um, but well worth a look if you're researching the history of a local community, because so often the school is the community and the community is the school. These are the six school files that we're going to talk about. So three of these schools are still open in some form and three have closed. There were and are more schools in Dubbo, of course. There are similarities between all of the school files. They reflect their times. They reflect both of the wars, but particularly World War I is strongly um, represented. Women having to resign if they marry, the depressions through the years, and the expanding and decreasing populations that they also reflect, that they also reflect their town. As Dubbo grows in population and area, so does the need for schools. And as a major town, children travelled to Dubbo for schooling, both from um, further afield and closer in, and that impacted on smaller schools outside Dubbo. Some school files are up to 15 boxes of papers. Some are only a couple of centimetres thick. The file for Dubbo Public School is over a metre of paper, literally. I've selected a very small quantity of papers from each of these schools. They have been digitised and put on the Dubbo Archives in Your Town page. So let's look at some of those pages. In 1876, there were conflicting opinions about whether additional accommodation was needed at Dubbo Public School. And the concern, and that's reflected in the letter on the right, where the council has resolved the existing buildings provide accommodation for a large number of pupils that now attend the school and therefore there was no need to erect an infant school. There was also concern regarding the proximity of the well to the toilets. The well was dug because there was no other water for the students while they're at school. So this is the old well which is between right close to the closets or toilets and this is where the new well is going to be and is that far, far enough away. So you can see huge range of information. In 1880, the infants teacher wrote to the secretary of the Council of Education as she was teaching in the shelter shed and she described the problems in detail. So the infants are exposed 
to the intense heat of the Dubbo sun, to the severe dust storms which rise rapidly here, frequently blowing down the blackboards and taking the books from the children's hands. The rain too on some occasions has beaten from one side of the shed to the other, compelling me to cease teaching. As the sides of the shed are quite open, fowls and dogs can find easy access and their presence does not conduce to promote the discipline of my class. In addition, the children can see and hear all that is happening passing Darling Street and the east of the schools. Two days after the infant's teacher sent this telegram, uh, sent this letter, she then sent a telegram to say that the head teacher had now provided a room of his residence for the infant's class. But you can imagine how crowded that must have been. At the end of 1880, 406 children were enrolled and with the growth of Dubbo and the enforcement of school attendance, 700 were expected in the new year. So new buildings were planned. This is a constant throughout all of the Dubbo primary schools history, I think. And in the meantime, there was a school tent. So this plan doesn't have a date, somewhere between 1881 and 1905. And you can see here the school tent. This red line is the dividing fence between the infant school and the girls primary school and the boys primary school. And as a Dubbo local, I'm sure you can picture where it is. It's still there between Darling Street and uh, between Darling Lane and Darling Street. The teachers had a huge amount of interaction with um, the department and the school files provide lots of information about the teachers at the school, but also how the system works. And at times it's surprisingly similar to today, even though we're talking about uh, well over a hundred years ago. Teachers could obtain rent assistance because the headmaster was generally provided with a school residence on site. But often the other teachers weren't local people and they had to find accommodation. So the left letter is from Fanny Gale requesting assistance with her rent, which she did obtain. And medical certificates had to be provided for sick leave. So on the right, is the medical certificate for Miss Grace Raymer, and in the middle, the wonderfully written letter. She has fantastic writing. I think it's a great thing she was a school teacher. Now established in 1880 across the whole state, there was a possibility of having evening public schools. They were designed to provide a elementary education for persons over 14 years of age, who previously received little or no education. They offered young men, because even though females could enrol, very, very few ever did. Two hours of instruction, three nights a week, usually conducted in the local public school by the headmaster or other teachers. Across the whole of the state, most of the schools were poorly attended. Dubbo Evening School only operated in 1887. But what it leaves us with is a list of people in town. I gather there were more than the 10, but 10 was the minimum to get the evening school up and running of people in the town who are interested in that possibility and in some cases their occupation at the time. So middle of the list is Frank James, at 18 he's a carpenter and that's his father signing, either as a parent guardian or employer. The next person at 19 is a chemist, David McCallum or David M. Callum is 18 and a grocer. So we've also got another grocer in a tanner. And down here is the inspector's comments that they are very suitable young men employed in various positions in Dubbo. At the teacher's own instigation, I understand, this has come about, they resolved to attend an evening public school for improvement. Arbor Day was a day started to encourage individuals and groups to plant trees. And it's been observed in Australia since 1889. So here you can see the totting up of the expenses, plans, cartridges, decorations for the school, tree protectors seems to be one of the main things ordered to buy. And on the right, the list of the children and the money they collected. And as you can see, some of these children were pretty good at collecting money. Walter Penziger managed to come back with over a pound. Some of them are collecting in groups, which I thought was quite clever. And all in all, they got more than 
12 pounds. That was with the archdeacon throwing in five pounds. But nine pounds note was spent on the refreshments for the children. While the Dubbo public school continued on, smaller schools outside Dubbo, Dubbo were established, changed names, changed type of school, prospered and over time closed as communities changed and transport improved. Bunyong began as a provisional school. So provisional schools could be established in areas where at least 15 children could be expected to attend. The parents had to provide the building and furniture, while the council or department of education paid the teacher and supplied books and equipment. After 1882, the department could provide or all apart the cost of the buildings, but parents often met most of the costs well into the 20th century. The schools were generally staffed by untrained teachers or by teachers of the lowest classification. This is part of an 1879 petition for a school. As you can see, there's more than enough to get past that um, list of 15 children. So again, it provides you with a picture of Bunny Yong in part in that time period. So at the top, John Hall with three children, aged seven, four and two, because they also wanted to know, you know, are there going to be more children coming along? So a range of ages, if you're looking down the list from two to 13, most families producing two to three potential students. And then from the inspector's um, description, it is placed in a corner of a man's farm given for the purpose, near the roadside about three miles eastward from Dubbo. So that gives you enough information to sort of place it in the, the area. Bunning Yong had a checkered life, probably similar to many small country town schools. It started as a provisional school in 1879, became a public school in 1882 for just over 20 years when its enrolment increased. It was a half-time school with Yulamongo for two years, meaning literally the teacher traveled between the two schools and you attended alternatively. A growth in population and changing rules meant it became a public school again in 1905 until it closed in 1922. So the letter on the left from 1880 reports that the schoolhouse had burnt down. Seems to be quite a common theme around this area. So I'm directed by the Council of Education to acquaint you that a letter or date of the 10th of instance has been received by this office from Mrs. Rosina King, the teacher of the provisional school at Bunyong reporting the destruction of the school building by fire and stating that a neighbour has lent a house in which to conduct the school pending instruction from the council, which is great, they just kept the school going. And then in 1881, enough children become a public school and they're going to move it to another site in that area where there'll be a tent provided accommodating not fewer than 30 pupils. In 1919, the teacher, at that time Mr Stinson, reports that no children attended school due to the scare occasioned by the outbreak of pneumonic influenza. There have been three cases from here with two deaths. Bunyong closed in October 1922. There were requests in the school file to reopen it in December 1922 and January 1927. Both were unsuccessful as the children were already attending school elsewhere and had transport subsidies or free rail tickets and a daily rail motor service. A new Bunny Yong school, I note, opened in Dubbo in 1996. Dun Dullamal started as a provisional school called Boggle Gubble in September 1895, closing again, or closing in September 1903 when the school burnt down. See what I mean? And as you can see, the teacher was in quite a bit of trouble about that. So the teacher is culpable, not for the fire, but in the following matters, having left the school fees in an insecure place, delaying in forwarding his fees to the cashier. So it sounds like people's school fields were burnt or lost in the fire and delay in reporting the destruction of his school by fire to this department. So he's going to be censured for his culpability in those matters. A second stint as a provisional school occurred from October 1905 to June 1908 under the name Dundalamal. And this plan shows a proposed new site on the Obley Road. So you can see underlined by red, proposed site, 
it puts it in the relationship of so where are the people living presumably that had potentially children to travel to this school and that's why they've chosen that site. Um, it then continued on as a public school until May 1914. Black Bunny Yong representations were made as late as 1922 to reopen the school on another site again. Mr J. E. Sirizia was told of, that of the 14 potential pupils, 10 were already enrolled at Yerubas Public School and the school building was going to be moved to Dickie Gundy. Delroy Public School opened to Sandy Creek in January 1898, changing its name to Delroy in 1899. There have been six Sandy Creek schools across New South Wales over time. So you can see that, you know, it'd be a good idea to change it, kindly interview a few interested and fix on a suitable name. So they've suggested down here underlined in red, Delroy. In 1898, the teacher, Mr. Sproul, requested provision of a residence as he had to live in Dubbo and travel each day out to the school. So he's provided a list of the families and the numbers of pupils and future pupils and their relative location to the school, obviously seeking to impress on people that the school would continue. He describes the school as in the midst of small farming areas which have recently been made available for the selection by the lands department about three miles west of Dubbo. So you picture Dubbo at this stage, this kind of the 1880s, 1890s, sort of ringed by the smaller schools are about three, three-ish miles out, which is if you were less than two, you're expected to make it to the existing school. A later teacher clearly had a buggy because he built a buggy shed for the school residents and requested reimbursement for the outlay. As you can see by this absolutely fantastic letterhead, the time of writing in 1916, he was Private G. Weber, M Company, Contact Camp AIF. And his address was South Coast Road, Wollongong. By the time the department replied, down here saying that on inspection, the buggy shed soundly constructed and the other work that he'd done was well done and they recommended that he should get the money back. He was Private Weber in B Company, 2nd Battalion at Liverpool, which was one of the big training camps and only his wife was at Wollongong. After the war, many towns obtained trophies of war. Delroy was allocated a machine gun by the State Trophy Committee. That's um, on the right, on the left, and the local trustees requested permission to house it in the Delroy School as there were no other public building available. Then on the right, a copy of the letter saying that the minister did not consider that machine guns were suitable for exhibition in schools. I picture quite a few disappointed small boys who would have thought they were very suitable. Delroy closed in 1930. And the inspector's letter is a picture of what occurred across many small towns and localities. Attendance has been on the decline for some time until now it is so low that continuance is not justified. Made inquiries about the possibilities of increased attendance in the future, but find there's no additional children who will be of school age for the next two years. Of the present enrolment of 11, three come from Dubbo each day. These could more conveniently be situated at Dubbo. The only boy in the school intends to leave next week. One girl of 14 is already seeking employment in Dubbo. So including the teacher's two children, who would have been moved with the teacher, there are no more than six pupils to be considered. Dubbo High School started in 1917 and continues today across multiple campuses. This memo from the headmaster, Mr. Klein, requesting permission for approval for dates for the annual swimming and athletics panel, also contains information about the town in 1936. Though he's requesting permission to have the swimming carnival on a Thursday, because it's impossible to hold it on the usual swimming day Wednesday, as that is the town half day, and note that this is in February, and we cannot get exclusive use of the baths on a Wednesday afternoon. So he's proposing Thursdays lesson, uh, moving Thursday sessions around. Another letter from Mr. Klein, also in 1936, requests permission to use the school hall for an event to celebrate the arrival of the Astley Cup, the Astley Cup 
The Dubbo had won in the annular triangular contest with Orange and Bathurst High Schools. So I can find reference to the Astley Cup in the newspapers on Trove from as early as the 1920s and as late as the 1950s. And it's regularly mentioned in the Dubbo High School file. Women resigned were terminated when they married, as married women were barred from public sector employment. Termination seems a much more modern term than from the 1930s. Generally, married women did stop teaching, um, but you'll see here that there's a reference to um, the Married Women Lectures and Teachers Act of 1932. And I wonder if that also reflects the problems with unemployment during the Great Depression and not wanting women to be taking men's roles. 1937, Dubbo is celebrating the coronation of King George VI and Elizabeth, his wife. So the school are planning on holding their coronation social on Tuesday the 11th of May because the civic celebrations to take place on Wednesday evening and our students, will, our, yes, our students will be attending that. And this letter is fascinating. So it's 1938, 20 years after the end of World War I and Edward Wallace, who's the deputy headmaster, has, still has war service leave. And he replies for permission to use two days to be in Sydney on Anzac Day and for another two days beyond that. And note he says, therefore, as a special train for returned soldiers does not leave Dubbo until Saturday the 23rd inst. So obviously quite a lot of emphasis was being placed on this 20 years Anzac Day. Dubbo West Public School started in 1944. Dubbo South and Dubbo North started as public schools in 1942. Dubbo North had operated as an infant school from 1931. So this is actually a page from the Dubbo public school file, but it shows the growth of all of the Dubbo public schools, all those central schools. Up here, under enrolment, B for boys, G for girls and I for infants. And you can see the movement of the numbers as the schools start up. So as Dubbo North and Dubbo South start taking primary age children, Dubbo Central goes from 909 enrolment, total enrolment to 780 total enrolment. Oh, sorry, that's average attendance. Oh my goodness me, some over a thousand enrolment down to 924. And then just continues to step down as people move around to the other schools, which should have eased some of the need for new school buildings, I guess. This is a letter from 1964, and it's clear about the need for additional accommodation at Dubbo West Public School and why. So looking at projections for growing enrolments, and then says the Housing Commission has recently acquired a large area of land in West Dubbo for home building, and a large private housing subdivision has also been approved by the Dubbo Municipal Council. So two different different sources of presumably more children to come to the school and the need to provide accommodation. Some of these later school files, so these are the post 1939 ones, seem to be just about the need for more land and buildings. And one of the Dubbo High School files seems to be completely about reopening roads that have been closed to provide more schooling space. So if you want to find school records, both sorts, this is our webpage, records.nsw.gov.au, quick links, online indexes. Then S for schools, schools, and don't be like me, scroll down so that you actually get the index that you want. So schools and related records, search the index. And all you need to do is type in Dubbo and you'll get a long list. So the administrative files are the school files that we've been talking about. 
and just need to go up a bit and increase the number of entries and scroll down again. So what you're looking for if you actually want to see children are admission registers and it looks like we hold no admission registers at all for Dubbo, which is not unusual. They seem to have been well, actually, as you know, there are a number of fires in schools in Dubbo. It's only just struck me that would explain some of the lack of admission registers and other records. So unfortunately, no. Really, there are just an observation book from the 1940s. So sadly, that would be a no, but that's how you do the search. The colonial architect started in 1832 and continued on as a government architect to the end of the 20th century. We hold plans from 1837 through to the 1970s. So they're plans of government buildings and the buildings of many purposes, land board offices, schools, hospitals, police stations, jails, courthouses, in coastal areas, pilot stations and lighthouses, and even post offices from before postal services became a federal responsibility. All of these buildings are often large and enduring, even if their purpose changes so the time. So I mean, Dubbo Jail being a classic example of that. of these in our collection and 438 of them have been digitised and you can find the digitised copies in collection search. The plans are of all sorts of public buildings from all over New South Wales, so things like police stations, courthouses, jails, public schools, public buildings like land offices, post offices, some of those big buildings that you might know in the city like the Registrar General's Office, the Colonial Secretary's Building and the Treasury Buildings are all included in these plans. But there are some plans that are closed to public access if they're of a security building like a jail or a police station or a courthouse that is still operating as a jail, police station or a courthouse, for example. So we do hold plans of Long Bay Jail and those plans are still closed to public access because Long Bay Jail still operates as a jail. And some of those very old country police stations as another example where the police are still inhabiting the building, those ones would be closed. But there are a lot that are open to public access. This is actually Dubbo Public School. As we know, there were lots of additions and changes and need for extra space. So what they're doing here is adding to the existing infant school in, or planning to in 1895. And it looks to me like they're adding this entire extra section, which looks enormous there, but when you look at the addition that seems to be coming out the side, it's not quite so large. And as ever, quite a pleasant little watercolour build um, plan. Dubbo Jail was also altered over time. A lot of these are already digitised and on our website. In this period, they're making additions to, they're adding this shelter in the exercise area. They're working on a shed and also on this office sort of area. So the series number is NRS 4335. So I, I keep talking about the series numbers because it is quite useful to get familiar with the idea that we have them. NRS is New South Wales Record Series and what a series does is describes and holds the records that are created for the same purpose. So you can search in two ways or should search in two ways. 
If you type NRS-4335 in a town name into collection search, it'll just bring you up every one of those plans with Dubbo in the title. And there are quite a few. You should also click on the online indexes through the quick links box. Click on A for architecture and design, search the index, and then type in the town name and you'll get again a few, uh, quite a few entries. Some of the plans have been digitised and are available to view online. And if they are in NRS 4335, they'll just appear when you decide the list of um, search results. Not all of the plans though are actually listed online. So if there was a particular public building you're interested in, you could use our inquiry service through the Ask an Archivist form on our website. So let's move on to the last of our building types. So NRS 15318, theatres and public halls files. Again, covering a huge time period, 1895 to 1992. These are private buildings, they're not government buildings. They were owned, so theatres and public halls were owned by private individuals, businesses, religious organisations, community groups and councils, and some government agencies. The reason the files exist is they had to be licensed. The licensing and regulations are basically related to public safety. And these theatres and public halls were used for many, probably more purposes than we could possibly guess. Dances, social gatherings, showing movies, live entertainment, skating, both roller skating and ice skating. And in amongst all of the other things that they provide is information about local businesses, both in relation to the theatres themselves were they owned by local people? Were they owned as part of a consortium from outside the local area? But also the building industry, because they were all built in town and altered in town and maintained in town. And you will sometimes see records of that. You'll also see the police and fire brigades playing a role in inspections. And the theatres and public halls are a large part of recreation in any town. And it's amazing how many towns there is one. The rise and fall of these buildings chart changes in population and in the broader world of recreation and the sorts of things that we want to do. Here today what we've got is the file for the Capital Theatre in Wagga. This file starts in 1929 when they were thinking about building the theatre and it carries all the way up to 1966 when they were thinking of pulling it down to put a coals over the top of it. A proposal to build an A-grade theatre at Wagga. It's talking about the location of the site and why it's such a good site um, and also the plans for what they intended to build on the site. So they were looking at that stage at, to accommodate up to 1,500 people um, and saying that the site faced Gurwood Street. The police have been asked to provide a report. They're inspecting public premises as well, so another evidence of other work that they did. Um, here we've got more of a fire inspection, looking at the different appliances and where they were. Here we go, we've got blueprints of the heating arrangements. Then here we've got details about how often they could show pictures here. So every night from sun Monday to Saturday and a matinee twice a week um, and no other uses for the licensed premises in question. So it was just to be used for the movies really, this one. We've got some lovely letterheads going through. And one interesting thing that happens with these, that some of these theatres and public halls start off as individual halls or theatres that over time were taken over and became part of a chain that might be through one particular area. Here is the plan of the capital theatre. The lounge seats and the dress circle seats. The boxes. 
and a stage. Some of these theatres would have been used for schools and other organisations as well. Sometimes public halls were actually used to house, cl house classrooms as towns expanded. Um, and so you can see some evidence of that. Here we've got a letter informing the authorities that the, the name was going to change from JK Capital Theatres to Hoyt's Country Theatres Proprietary Limited. And the file continues onwards to 1965-1966 and at that time the theatre was closed down as it was sold in 1965 by Hoyt's which we can see here uh, was GJ Coles and they were going to build a supermarket at that location. And we'll now have a look at just one of the quite a few licensed theatres and public halls in Dubbo. Again, we just digitised an extract from the file and I'm going to only show you a very small number of pages from this. So have a look on the Archives in Your Town page. The Railway Institute in Tauberga Street was opened in 1929 with a smoke social. Not something you'd hear now serving as a hall for the Railway Institute, and it had which the Railway Institute had branches across New South Wales, but it was also used for many community purposes. So this is on the left, a copy of the letter that was sent to the Chief Secretary's Department for asking for permission. Desirous of opening in the institution, Institute Social Hall at Dubbo by the holding of a smoke social on the 24th instant, at which smoking will be indulged in, and at which light liquor will be partaken of. The social will be under the patronage of departmental offices. And then down here on the right is the response, which is giving permission, but please pay your $1 licensing fee to get that immediately, to get that all sorted. This is a plan of the building. It was basically just a large, simple room. It could seat 300 people. So Talbrica Street um, here, gate, uh, line, porch, basically windows all around and lavatories out the back. Pretty much like a hundred other halls that you'd see throughout the state. These are the inspection notes from the very first inspection. So licensed public theatres and public halls were inspected annually, usually by one of the local police officers. The hall was licensed up until 1981. So you can see that it's basically made of fibro cement roof, fibro and pine walls, wooden floor, chairs, but they're not fixed, it's got electric light. It doesn't have an exit sign, so that didn't go down well. There's water laid on from the town supply, so no need for or there were no chemical extinguishers. Sanitary conveniences for men provided ladies lavatory will be completed in two months. So really simple. The series number is NRS 15318. Just type that into collection search on our website. All of the files that we hold are listed online, but none of the files are digitized. But I always say, and I know it's easy for me to say, knowing something exists is the first part of being able to decide whether or not you can see it. So I'm going to move on to the file series that are about people. And the first of those are the bankruptcy files, which cover 1888 to 1929. So bankruptcy is a state, this is the definition, I think, is a state in which a person is unable to pay creditors and is required to undergo a legal process that usually results in liquidation of his or her estate in order to meet expenses, at least in part. And often the um, uh, creditors didn't get much, if anything. If a person's declared to be bankrupt, then they can, can't operate a business for profit, enter a business contract or borrow money. It's similar but not identical to insolvency. And I mentioned insolvency because we also hold insolvency files. Bankruptcy files contain lists of creditors that the bankrupt person owed money to and debtors that owed money to the bankrupt person. So through these lists, you really get to see the commercial connections both within a town, 
between towns and with Sydney. So where are goods and money flowing? Who's buying what locally? Who's buying what externally? It's sometimes a bit surprising. The bankrupt person also provides a statement about why they became bankrupt, often providing a picture of what's happening in the town and beyond. The files of bankrupt people in the town collectively show what sorts of businesses were operating. And I guess gives you an indicator of how the buildings, uh, the businesses were going or not going well. So we hold quite a good collection of bankruptcy files. They cover from 1888 up to 1928. This particular file I've got in front of me is for a man called Elijah Alexander, who went bankrupt in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So the files contain a lot of repetitive material because at the base it's really about how much money was owed by the bankrupt and how much money could they get back from their creditors and give their debtors. Okay, so usually there's a statement on the file to where the bankrupt gets a chance to explain what led up to their current unfortunate situation. So he says he was recently the licensee of the Freemasons Hotel at Broken Hill and he's the bankrupt. He filed a statement of his affairs with the registrar in Sydney and he goes through a list of creditors that owe him money. He says he was insolvent previously in 1881. He attributes his bankruptcy to sickness in the family and the drought in 1891-92 um, and the Broken Hill strikes by which his house was boycotted and also losses on a contract to provide food for free labourers on the mines during the strikes. Um, he had three partners and he, he and his partners lost £670 by a contract due to a range of issues with the partnership he took possession of the hotel in 1891 um, he gave the company 1036 pounds in cash and then proceeded to spend quite a bit of money on the hotel had to value all the furniture and effects in the hotel he says he's been out of employment since the whole thing started and we do remember too that in 1891 there was also a depression so I'm sure that did not help matters at all. So here we've got a lot of creditors unsecured um, and the kinds of people who were creditors were brewers and merchants and wine merchants, tea merchants, chaff merchants. We've got debts to the estate. Some of these people I th or possibly most of these people might be people who just owed the hotel money for drinking debts perhaps. Uh, so there's quite a people working at the proprietary mine who all owed like one and two pounds, three pounds sometimes. Here we have a list of goods that were bought of Alex Marshall, the wholesale and family butcher in Broken Hill, prime beef. And looking through it, we notice that there's a lot of cooked beef, there's mutton, there's raw beef, mints giving us an idea of what people ate when they went to the hotel in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So in this list from this wholesale and retail cash grocer, Huskisson & Co, we've also got food, so things like raisins and vinegar, uh, thyme, flour, rice, oatmeal, quarter of a tonne of sugar, would you believe, sago, turmeric, allspice, currants, lots of proofs of debt from various creditors and this sort of thing. Um, as we just saw, the invoices from and the letterheads from the creditors can be quite beautiful pieces of art in themselves.
the names of everyone who's got a bankruptcy file in this period are listed in our online indexes and in our catalogue. So you can search for the name and the location of the person. So Hector McLean was a blacksmith in Dubbo. He was in business with Alexander Russell. Hector McLean was declared bankrupt on the 21st of October in 1892. McLean and Russell both borrowed money to buy the blacksmith business. Hector McLean stated that one of the causes of his bankruptcy was the reduced number of wool teams coming to Dubbo. This was due to a dispute between the graziers of the Canamble district and the carriers union of Dubbo. The Canamble graziers didn't send their wool to Dubbo railway station for transport to city. Sydney as they'd usually done. Instead, they sent the wool to Nevertar railway station. So only 15 teams came to Dubbo in 1892 instead of the usual 200 teams. You could see what impact that could have on a blacksmith's business. And I suspect actually on all of the businesses in Dubbo. He also goes on to say, there was also a falling off in general business during the winter of um, 1892 owing to the season being a very wet one and constantly unfavourable and consequently unfavourable to wheel rise in as much as it prevented a good deal of traffic. Before that the business, this is before they had run it I think because they hadn't run it for terribly long, was a lucrative one and were it not for these circumstances I believe the profits we would have gained during the charm room business would have enabled us to meet all of the liabilities we had incurred. Hector McLean also stated that neither he nor his partner Alexander Russell really understood bookkeeping. It turns out that they basically took in money, in cash money, and I put it somewhere like in the business. And when they needed to spend money, whether it was for personal or business reasons, they just took money back out of the money that had come in. The partner's unsecured liabilities, so what they owed other people, were over 118 pounds. Their unencumbered assets were worth 62 pounds. Hector McLean also had nine pounds of debts. So this is a list of the creditors and it gives, as I said, that picture of what is happening in the town in terms of, so there's obviously at least two butchers, which you'd expect in Dubbo, it's a sizable town even by 1892. Um, storekeeper, uh, a number of storekeepers. Innkeeper, they seem to spend quite a bit of money at the inn. They also did live there at one stage. Both were bachelors at the time that they started the business. Um, the sawmills at Dubbo, sawmills are also at Parramatta. So again, that flow of goods into the town from outside of Dubbo, but a lot of trading within Dubbo. The second sheet down the bottom is the unsecured creditors for Hector McLean himself. So he owed five, over five pounds to the tailor in Dubbo for a suit of clothes. And he owed over three pounds for a picture portrait from the picture dealer in Dubbo. So finding NRS 13658 bankruptcy files, go to our website, click on online indexes in the quick links box, click on B for bankruptcy, click on bankruptcy insolvency in the list of topics, choose either bankruptcy, so 1888 to 1929, or insolvency 1842 to 1887. Click on search the index. Type the person's name or a town name, <coughs> excuse me, in the search box and press enter. And I apologize, I haven't entered here. All of the bankruptcy insolvency files that we hold are listed. None are digitized other than the ones that we've had digitized for the archives in your town series. Um, and we don't offer a copy service for them because they're very large and there is quite a lot of um, repetitious paperwork in them. So I think Hector McLean's is about 130 pages. Moving on to another of the series about people. So NRS 1340, NRS 13340 deceased estate files cover 1880 to 1958. So these were created for deceased estates for every individual who died living property or other assets, basically to decide whether or not death duty would be charged. And if they were going to charge death duty, how much the death duty would be. 
So they're really a financial record of the person's estate when they die. And the files often have very detailed information about a person's possessions. Absolutely always look for them if you can. So have a look at Martin on the behind the scenes video. Hi everyone and welcome to this next instalment of our Archives Behind the Scenes videos from New South Wales State Archives. We're in cell 10, uh, the famous green cell, not only because it has a green floor and green shelves, but even green labels on all of the boxes that are in here as well. One of the highlights of the State Archives collection that are held in this cell are around 7,000 boxes of deceased estate files from the Stamp Duties Office. These are files that were created when death duty was payable in New South Wales. The series of files dates from 1880 through to the late 1950s, and they are a financial record of someone's estate when they died. So in order to establish how much death duty was payable on an estate, that estate had to be valued in some way. And in order to provide that value, you had to list out and enumerate all of someone's real estate, their personal belongings, and their other personal estate. And that's exactly what these deceased estate files are. They're a financial record, but a real treasure trove of information. Now you can access indexes to the deceased estate files on our website, and also on the websites of our partners, Ancestry and Find My Past. So between those three websites, and our website address is www.records.nsw.gov.au, you should be able to find an entry for anyone that you might be interested in in the deceased estate files. Anyway, what sort of information do they show? Come a little bit closer and I'll show you an example of one of the files. So this is the file for John Henry Williams, who dies in Sydney in Randwick in 1945. His file typically comprises an overall value of his estate and then the paperwork to do with the administration of his estate and that whole process of enumerating the estate. So page upon page of details of this person's estate. What's really interesting about this example, and it's by no means an unusual example, is the wonderful listing of all of the personal estate that was contained when John Henry Williams died in 1945. So you'll see listings here of furniture, of cushions, of curtains, of glassware, and a value for each item. Because that's exactly what these files are, remember, is a financial record of someone's estate. So they're a wonderful source of information because they tell you how someone was living at the time of their death and what objects, what estate, what real estate, what personal estate they left when they died. Bye for now. There are files for people from all walks of life, men and women, all ages, and pretty much all financial positions. The deceased estate files in the probate packets that we'll look at next, basically between them cover the wrap up of a person's estate when they died. The probate packets show what happens to the estate. So basically who inherits? The deceased estate files are about calculating death duty. There is an overlap between the two series, but it's always worth looking at both because together they give you that much fuller picture. Both series provide great information about a person and how they live their lives. But they also provide a lot of information about the town the person lived in, what businesses there were, who knew who, who dealt with who, what sort of housing there was. So the two deceased estate files we're going to have a look at are both from the 1930s, the typical of people of their time and their jobs. They both also have probate packets, but just focusing here on their deceased estate files. So what you can see on the screen now is part of the affidavit, which is common across all of the deceased estate files. They change a little bit over time. The system always refines as you get closer and closer to present time. So this is for Joseph Rizieri Tenney, a retired farmer in Dubbo who died in 1934, aged 65. Joseph Tenney had been a farmer at Benny, a small town outside Dubbo, and it's his wife, Isabella Tenney, who signed the affidavit. So you can see up here, Isabella Evelyn Tenney, who's a widow by that stage. His estate was worth over um, £1,400, and he did, they did have to pay death duty of about £17. 
So inside that affidavit, you'll always get a list of assets and a list of um, debts. The majority of his estate was made up of the property that he owned. He had few debts, just council rates and medical fees. So remembering that these in the probate packets are always the records of people who have died. Debts to hospitals, doctors, chemists are very common throughout them. So I mean, even and in and of themselves, that gives you a picture of the sorts of money that needed to be expended. Um, when I talk about Joseph Tenney, some of it I'm getting from the deceased estate file, but also from obituaries found on that wonderful thing, Trove. Um, so Joseph Tenney was unwell for a while before he died. So basically the property, um, some rents accrued and one pound in his banking account. This is a certificate of valuation, really common throughout both the probate packets and the deceased estate files and gives you great information. So after selling the farm, Joseph and Isabella Tenney had been living in Dubbo in Darling Street. Isabella inherited everything other than £100, which was left to their son. And this is why widows' deceased estate files can sometimes be even more useful because some of the detail about the contents of a property may not necessarily be listed in detail if the husband dies first. So this one tells us, I'm getting fairly good at reading the, the um, abbreviations in the improvements. So down the bottom, I think this says that it's a brick shop and dwelling. It's got three rooms. I think it's a corrugated iron roof, a brick garage, an iron roof, galvanised iron sheds with iron roof. So it gives you that picture in um, the, 18, uh, the 1930s about that property, where it is in Dubbo and what was on the property. So our next deceased estate file is Sophia Augusta Maria Massart. It was a widow when she died in Dubbo in 1934, age 62. Her sons, Charles and Dudley, um, signed the affidavit. Her estate, much different, was worth just over £187. So her properties worth £150, furniture over £55 and um, watches, trinkets and jewellery etc, £1. And again the sign of the times that her um, debt is that she obviously they needed to pay back some old age pension, something that wouldn't have been found in the earlier things. So valuation of Sophia Massart's property, which is in number three, Cerisia Street. Um, I'm reading this as a double fronted weatherboard cottage with four rooms and a corrugated iron roof. What is absolutely fabulous about the deceased estate files in particular is the detail that you can get like this about what people owned which helps you picture how they live their lives. And not just Sophia in this case, but by extension, other people of that time. I'd say that you'd say that Sophia Massart seems to have been comfortable. Um, the sitting room has six chairs, two armchairs, a small table, sideboard, couch, two mats, a hall runner, lino, two cushions, curtains and blinds and lampshade. So it's not just the necessities, it's comfortable. It has things that are there because they're pleasant to have. Um, bedroom number one, presumably the main bedroom, double bed and mattress, bed, tick and pillows. The bedroom suites worth six pounds. That's so quite a large item. Curtains and blinds, two mats, toilet set and the lino. So things that are familiar to us and things that are not. Um, but the detail, the detail, even what's in the laundry. There's a safe, there's two tubs, there's a ringer, chair, dish, primer stove, dipper and can, three lamps and a meat safe. In the back veranda, which let's face it is nearly the most important room even today in people's houses. 
drip safe, table, stool, garden hose, garden tools. So lots of things that are familiar and there are things that are missing. There's no, obviously there's no refrigerator in this house in the 1930s, instead she's got a whole range of different sorts of um, safes to keep food cool. So if you want to find a deceased estate file, and obviously you should, NRS 13340, go to our website, click on online indexes in the quick links home box, click on D for deceased estate files, click on deceased estates, and then search the index. So as I said, you could do a person's name or the town name. The index covers 1880 to 1939, but the files cover 1880 to 1958. So if you have access to Ancestry, try Ancestry for the 1940 to 1958 period. We do offer a copy service for these files, which means you can just order them through our website and they cost $37.90. And the great thing is you'll be able to have a look at the deceased estate files across all of the archives in your town. Um, pages and that will give you an idea of the sorts of information that there is. So probate packets. NRS 13660, they cover 1817 to 1976. Huge, huge slice of New South Wales history. The grant of probate is basically the authority given by the Supreme Court of New South Wales to the executor or executors to deal with the pers a deceased person's estate. The sorts of things you'll get in the probate packet include if there was a will, the last will and testament, any codiciles to the will, and if there wasn't a will, then the letters of administration. There are lots of forms which um, basically set out that they've done all the steps they should do, that there'll be affidavits, affidavits to say that they've advertised to let people know. And the other thing to remember is not everyone has a probate packet. Depending on the size, type and value of the assets located in New South Wales, it may not be necessary to obtain a grant of probate in New South Wales. There's no statutory requirement to obtain probate in every case. But it is also interesting to note that if you had assets in New South Wales, you may well have a deceased estate file or a probate simply because you had assets in New South Wales. Hi and welcome to the latest instalment of Behind the Scenes here at New South Wales State Archives. I'm down here in what we call Stage 5 of our facility, which is where we store one of our most popular record series, the probate packets. Probate packets contain the last will and testament of the person who passed away, as well as other administrative documents around settling of the estate. And as you can see, we've got boxes and boxes of them. In fact, we hold probate from 1817 right up to 1976, as well as a bit of 1989. And the remaining packets are held by the New South Wales Supreme Court. So why are they called packets? Well, as you can see, the New South Wales Supreme Court used to store the documents in these envelopes. But they're pretty hard to get out sometimes. And in fact, I can't even get the records out of this one. So now that they're here at the archives, wherever possible, we try to move the records into these white archival envelopes and they're much roomier and generally much better for the records. So what else can you find in a probate packet? Well, sometimes you can find birth and marriage certificates because people had to prove who they were in order to gain their inheritance, particularly women who may have married. And sometimes you find very unique artifacts in the probate packets. And one of my favorites I'm going to show you now. This is the last will and testament of Cecil Winch who was a soldier who went off to World War I and unfortunately lost his life in Gallipoli. And he penned his will on the back of the family photo that he carried with him to war. And to me, it's just a poignant reminder of the death and grief that that generation suffered during a horrible time in our history. But don't just take my word for it. If you'd like to go looking for a probate packet for someone in your family, head over to our website put their name in the search box on the home page, and don't forget to add the word death. If you have any trouble, have a look at the probate guide on our website under Research A to Z, or you're welcome to give us a call or drop us an email. Anyway, it's time for me to get back to work. And of course, the box I want is right up on the top shelf. It's lucky I'm not afraid of heights. See you next time.
And so let's look at some probate packets. We're looking at two from really very different times, 1880 and 1954. But despite that, these are people that are typical of their time and their roles, while also being special because of who they are, because both men were quite notable in their time. Jean Emile Chouizier established a store on the side of Dubbo in the 1840s. This is from Australian Dictionary Biography from 1848 to 1866. He's involved in most local activities, agitating for Dubbo to be surveyed as an electoral returning officer, a magistrate, justice of the peace, secretary of the public school board, a Rhodes trustee, first president of the Dubbo Free Selectors Association and treasurer of the first jockey club. So Jean Struzia was also a substantial landowner and winemaker. And of course, presumably the man that the street Sophia Massart lived in was named after. Most, if not all, probate packets contain an affidavit of death. So basically someone has to swear that the person whose probate it is, is dead. It's all the more important when the person died overseas. So Sirizia died in Paris while visiting his country of birth. This is an affidavit of death by his son who was in Paris with him. So basically it's just a formal document saying that duly swear and maketh oath that I did see the dead body of the above and then talks about the interment of the body. You'll often find that affidavits of death are from the local undertaker. You have to say that you knew the person and in many places the local undertaker probably knew just about everyone in town. This is Jean Emile Cerizia's last will and testament. I think it's a bit of a classic will with its red sealing wax and its green ribbon. His estate was worth £2,370 and administering his will led to an Act of Parliament. An Act to authorise the mortgage and leasing of certain lands and hereditaments devised by the will of Jean Emile Cerizia deceased and for other purposes. And there's a link to that Act, the text of the Act from the Archives in Your Town page for Dubbo. Basically, he left a quarter of his estate to his wife, or if she remarried within 18 months, a sixth of it. The trustees would manage the remainder of the estate for his children until the youngest reached 21. And the act, this is my reading of it, the act was necessary to enable his trustees and any future trustees of other estates to manage the estate over time. They just needed to sort that out so that it was um, quite proper. And this is just the rest of that will with his signature here. It was made in 1879, so presumably and sensibly prior to the overseas trip. And it's very typical of its time, particularly for someone in the sort of position that he held in town. So now moving forward to 1954. The William, otherwise known as Bill Ferguson, was 68 when he died in 1950. Bill Ferguson was a trade unionist an Aboriginal politician. He and his family settled in Dubbo in 1933 and in Dubbo he launched the Aborigines Progressive Association. When the government changed the Aborigines Welfare Board so that there would be two elected Aboriginal representatives, Bill Ferguson was elected and served for a number of years. Now unlike Emil, uh, Jean Emile Scherzier, Bill Ferguson didn't leave a will and so his estate wasn't probated until 1954. So in his probate packet, there's this sort of affidavit, which you're already familiar with um, from the deceased estate files. It tells us that he was a labourer when he died, that his wife's name's Margaret Ferguson, he's 68 and when he died. Um, and the balance of the estate's about 527 pounds. Further on, there's a question is, which is I've made a diligent search for a will of the deceased and it says state what searches were made. So Margaret has said, the deceased did not have a bank account and I've inquired at the office of all the solicitors practicing in Dubbo. And I've searched among personal effects of the deceased and I've been unable to find any will. So the bulk of his estate, like many other people, is of course the family home. Um, which was in Wingwara Street. It's a weatherboard cottage, three rooms, kitchen and offices with an iron roof. 
office is of course not being as we would know it in the modern term, but bathroom and toilet, those sorts of things. As there was no will, the estate was divided according to intestacy rules, so basically the established rules. So that meant that his wife Margaret got a third of the estate and two thirds of the estate would then be split between his children. How do you find probate packets? Go to our website, type in either NRS 13660 or just the word death because that appears in all of the item titles and a person's name into collection search. All of the files we hold are listed online. None of the files are digitised, but we do have a copy service and copies of files can be ordered for $53.80. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about Dubbo. Make sure you have a look at the Dubbo archives in your town webpage. There's a link from the news box on the homepage. And just last credits, this is yet another plan of Dubbo Jail, and this was going to be a new residence for the warder.